Hello. Okay. Um, so I'm Siri Lee, uh, a visual uh, storyteller based uh, in New York and Beijing. And up here is it's all a history of Chinese discourse through famine and revolution, which is um, a 300 plus page artist book that I made um, over the past two years. Um, and these here are large format spreads, are prints of spreads from the actual books themselves, which are laid out on the counter here. Um, but what Zhao is, is it's a speculative visual history of um, modern Chinese history, um, specifically focusing on the Mao era. And within that, specifically on the events leading up to and during the Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution which were events that took place, uh, political movements that took place from the 1950s to the 1970s. And these movements were supposed to um, bring China into this uh, unprecedented communist utopia, but instead led to uh, the Great Chinese Famine in uh, 1958 to 1962, like, basically concurrent with the Great Leap Forward, um, in which anywhere between 17 to 55 million people starved to death, uh, largely because of uh, state policies associated with the Great Leap Forward. And after, less than five years after that was the Cultural Revolution, which saw um, the mass persecution and murder of so-called like counter-revolutionary intellectuals um, across the country. So um, for people who are watching who might not have known that much about this period of history, um, that you are not uh, alone in this. This is in part, in no small part, because um, the party that is, was responsible for these uh, deaths and this indoctrination is still in power. Um, and so a lot of the statistics also are kind of uh, mired in censorship and um, the fact that all these statistics from decades ago are still not publicly available, are even available to most scholars and journalists. Um, but anyways, my uh, project is basically trying to investigate that period of history in spite of the fact that it is still so censored and so little known in both mainland Chinese and Western public discourse. Um, so it takes like two years ago, basically around this time, I actually returned to Beijing and went into the local archives. And there I didn't really find any of the statistical information about the negative aspects of the Mao era, but I did find a lot of propaganda from that time period, which is re very revealing in and of itself. So I decided to make a work that would kind of try to um, put the propaganda and the statistical facts um, on the same page. And to do so, um, I resorted to a lot of collage, a lot of um, photo montage, and mixing my own um, narrative with the actual historical narrative of the time period, um, as well as my own translations and mistranslations. And the overarching genre of this work is something that I call faction, which is a conflation of fact and fiction, because the whole a big part of my understanding of the Mao era is this, is trying to understand it through the veil of, of fiction um, and trying to understand what the facts are and if there can really, if facts can be found um, at all. Um, so yeah, it, it's um, the, the actual factional story uh, storyline that I invented um, is kind of along the lines of a conspiracy theory. It understands, it asks readers to understand Chinese history um, as Sinese history, so like a linguistic sign, because the, the idea is that um, this is a book about the Sinese civilization, which practiced a, a mode of language and agriculture called lingua culture, in which words and food are literally the same. And this is based off of all the propaganda from, the era, from that era as well, where you have all this imagery of abundant food at the same time as you have this total scarcity of intellectual thought and also of actual food um, because people were dying from famine. So I'm thinking, I see this sort of, this contradiction um, 
in the food that is visualized versus the food that people actually had access to and the intellectual thought that people are supposed to have versus what they actually have access to. And I thought, well, it's really not, it's almost kind of natural to just say, what if we, I literally just conflated the two, the food and the language. And so Zhao as a whole then is tracing the extinction of language, of lingua culture over the course of the famine and the cultural revolution. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, so let's see. A lot of this is, okay, I can read um, some of the, I can start out just to set the scene with uh, reading some of my translations of some slogans from the Mao era. So here you have, um, this which is composited from various pieces of propaganda. And some of the um, slogans there are translate to, heaven on earth is with praise showered, red seeds bloom into red flowers, Marta's fresh blood across the lush land poured, communism produces golden gourds. And that's not my like factional thing about trying to make language and food the same. This was actually, this is just a literal translation of a poem then. And then you have other examples um, up here. You have a poem that is literally called Stir Frying Steel. Um, that is not, that's not like my creation. It's literally called Chao Gang. And the whole thing is about praising the Great Leaps Forward industrialization efforts, um, which actually were miserable in that they produced mostly pig iron, which was useless in actual, um, for in actual industrial purposes. But the poem goes, the furnaces fire burn in a rage. The people's hearts melt with joy. Steel flowers splash inside the furnace. A field of red before the furnace. Steel flowers fly and splatter. Everyone smiles. The people are redder than even the steel flowers. Um, and I could read it in Chinese too if you want the. Okay. Lu huo xiong xiong shao, ren xin le rong rong, lu nei gang huo jian, lu qian yi pian hong. So that's Chao Gang. Um, and then uh, I think uh, one of the last things I could read a snippet from is um, a story in Zhao towards the end that is actually an autobiographical story from of my, it's a visual rendition of my mother's memories of um, a struggle session that was launched against her family um, when she was seven years old um, towards the beginning of the Cultural Revolution. And um, for those who are unfamiliar, a struggle session is basically a public uh, humiliation event um, that gathers you know, all the people in the neighborhood to um, denounce certain counter-revolutionary individuals. And my grandparents were deemed such because of some critical comments they had made of like an anti-rightist campaign that had happened like a decade earlier. Um, but they were also loyal party members <laughs> at the time. And so I kind of inter I looked at some of my mom's um, autobiographical writings um, from the time period and did uh, made a short story uh, about it and inserted it into the larger narrative that is of more dubitable, dubitable truth st status. So, I don't know if you guys can come over here. Um, um, yeah. uh, so it's called House Raid, Chaojia. In my mother's memory, it was a stuffy, windless evening around early May, a dull evening with a four-person family in separate rooms. But just then, they heard a loud knock at the door and before my grandfather could reach the door, the knock changed into impatient pounding accompanied by the voices of people. In a second, the door was flung open. About a dozen men and women burst in, and without any explanation or order from anyone, they immediately dashed from room to room, dumping the contents of all the drawers and dressers onto the floor. Someone broke a bottle of cologne, a kind of liquid distilled from honeysuckle flowers, and the unnaturally sweet odor soon permeated the entire apartment. My mother and uncle were approached by a short, lithe man with a horse-like face, whom she recognized as one of my grandmother's subordinates at work and an uh, old family acquaintance. He embarked on a long lecture, informing her that her parents were counter-revolutionary elements and that she and her brother must make a clean break with them. 
Stunned and afraid, my mother nods. The entire family is dragged downstairs with varying degrees of force. My mother sees her parents pushed and shoved and held by several, several powerful arms into the center of a circle thickened by a large crowd from the neighborhood. Um, that's my grandma and grandpa, um, loyal party members. My grandparents were nonetheless branded rightist traitors because they had previously criticized party policy. Her parents are forced to bow their heads. She and my uncle are given front row views in the inner ring. She feels the pressure of the horse-faced man's hand on her shoulder and realizes what is expected of her. She opens her mouth and joins the crowd shouting slogans at her parents, yelling at the top of her lungs, yet hearing no sound. After an interminable time, the people finally leave and my mother, uncle, and grandparents return to their apartment. My mother and uncle flee to their shared bedroom, where they watch their parents in the living room through a tiny crack in the door. There, under the ghastly bright fluorescent light and the severe stare of the chairman's large portrait on the wall, her parents still stood rigidly, as if obeying some inaudible order. She seems to recall my grandmother's face distorted in silent weeping, the anguished lines gathering around her lips in some plaintive speech, probably appealing to the sensible judgment of the omnipresent chairman. But back to abstractions. And after that, I go back into the whole... Um, sort of toying with the propaganda of the time and trying to reveal um, the hunger that underlays all these images of plenty. Um, yeah, but that's the basic gist. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>